I want to say a quick hello to our listeners on Stitcher. As you may have heard, the Stitcher app is going away on August 29th, but don't worry, we will still exist and you will still be able to find us. You can listen and subscribe to Big Mood, Little Mood on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or anywhere else you can find podcasts, like on a mysterious sidewalk that only appears at four in the afternoon in a certain part of town. And thanks so much for being a loyal listener. Welcome back to the Big Mood, Little Mood show. I'm your host, Danny Lavery, and with me in the studio this week is Vani Gupta, a speech-language pathologist in Sydney, Australia. It's 7 a.m. where she is. I just want you to know her dedication to helping people with their problems is significantly higher than mine because if I had had to get up at 7 a.m. to help people at any point throughout having this job, I would have helped no people. So there it is. She has a master's in creative writing. She's now doing a research degree looking at how children talk about their own experiences. Bonnie loves dogs and books and giving unsolicited advice, which is actually going to hold you back today because all of this advice is very much solicited. Uh, But I hope it's not too limiting a factor. Thanks, Danny. Um, Well, it is going to be a change because I often don't have to give solicited advice. Well, I hope that there's not too much different. I suppose the biggest difference is you can allow yourself to go on a little bit longer uh, because you've, you know, you've got an excuse to do so. That's right. Well, um, going long is not a problem for me either. (laughs) I love to give advice. I love to repeat myself and um, hopefully it'll be helpful to the letter writers today. Yeah, I hope so too. I'm interested in today's episode, especially because there's a fair amount of, some of them are updates One of them has a sort of significant resonance with a a recent episode that I do want to mention before we get into it, which is kind of fun. It almost feels like it could potentially be somebody who is in another person's scenario. And and I always like that, seeing if like a letter kind of fits into another letter, like two reverse sides of a puzzle. So there's, there's a lot of layering going on today, and I'm kind of excited about that. And I'm especially excited about our first letter, I think, because it, it has one of my sort of favorite issues, which is I feel both guilty and defensive. And um, I don't mean to say that I feel excited that someone feels that way because I understand that's difficult and they've been, you know, going through something painful. They did something they're not proud of. They're trying to navigate how to be in a relationship with somebody that they've hurt and who is also kind of mad at them. Um, But I, I guess I just really, on a human level, appreciate that sort of honesty in a letter of both, I'm kind of ashamed and I'm kind of proud and I kind of want to justify things, and I kind of don't, and I kind of want to pursue pleasure, and I kind of want to pursue punishment, and um, I I like that sort of thing. Yes, I think um, all of the letters that you've got today are really thoughtful people, perhaps overthinkers, which I can certainly relate to. And I think it's interesting when we talk about feelings, there's not just a single feeling we have, and it's quite complicated when you've got more than one way that you think or feel about something. But that's also what I think makes us very human. Yeah. Yeah. So with that sort of preface, I think I should just read our first letter and get us right into it, if that sounds all right to you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So the subject is, I'll wear the hair shirt, but how thick should it be? Which I really liked. This was also not a subject line that I chose. This was one that someone wrote in with, and I really liked it. I'm a 35-year-old queer woman in a monogamous marriage with my male partner. We have a young child together. We have a phenomenal relationship. He's super smart, kind, supportive, and makes me a better person. During the pandemic, I had a male therapist. Our relationship became sexual. There was no physical contact, but I sent erotic photos, and we had some sexual dirty talk in some of our therapy sessions. I never told my husband about this. I had convinced myself that because this took place within therapy that it wasn't really cheating. I ended therapy several months ago. Last month, I took psilocybin and had a really awful trip. I told my husband about things with a therapist during that trip while my husband was sober. He's deeply hurt, partly by my actions, but more that I hid them from him all this time. He trusted me completely. I've shattered his trust, and it's palpable in our day-to-day interactions. I'm struggling with what to think of this situation. I feel stupid and selfish for taking my husband's trust for granted. I also feel betrayed by my therapist, but I'm wondering if I'm just abdicating personal responsibility by blaming him. 
I think he genuinely cared about me, but he was also attracted to me and had a responsibility to set boundaries that he did not fulfill. I have a history of multiple sexual traumas from college, including from a psychology professor who had been a mentor of mine, which was made worse by my evangelical Christian beliefs at the time. The therapist knew about this history, which makes the sexual nature of our relationship feel worse. Do you have advice on how to mend trust with my husband? I'm hurting, but I don't feel that I deserve compassion because of the harm I've caused. But maybe that's just my shame from past trauma. I'm about to start therapy again with a female therapist, and we're looking into couples therapy as well. P.S. I don't have a substance abuse problem. I've taken psychedelics a small handful of times, which is common in my peer group. I love that too, because like, I I hope I don't so often diagnose people with substance abuse problems that someone feels like anytime they mention a drug, they have to be like, don't worry. But also, man, if, if, if you manage to develop a substance abuse problem solely on like magic mushrooms, that's almost impressive. I feel like that would take a lot of work. So, you know, letter writer, just so you know, I'm on the same page. I also don't think you have a psilocybin problem. I'm sorry you had a bad trip, but uh, I'm I'm comfortable with your psilocybin use if you are. (laughs) I I feel like the place that I wanted to start with was that line. um, I'm hurting, but I feel like I don't deserve compassion because of the harm that I've caused, which I I think the letter writer kind of has to know nobody is going to say you're right, you don't deserve compassion. So to me, that feels kind of like the sort of thing you say to preemptively beat yourself up so someone has to be nice to you. And to be clear, letter writer, I want to be nice to you. I I, I care about you. You're a worthwhile person. Uh, I, I don't mean to like accuse you of any sort of like machinations there. Just I found that kind of like, yeah, you're trying to put on the hair shirt preemptively to keep anyone else from smacking you on the wrist. And I admire that and I see through it. Um, so I'll just say, of course, you deserve compassion. But also, I think maybe the the way that I would reframe that sentence is probably the person that you're not going to be able to get the most compassion from right now is your husband, who, you know, has every right to be mad about your lying to him and cheating on him. That doesn't mean he has to hate you forever, that you two can't ever work through this. But he he's probably not going to be the number one person who helps you out through this in terms of reassuring you or making you feel better. And so I would just encourage you to Bear that in mind so you're not surprised. And so you don't kind of try to lean on him too much. Because if you're like, and now I need you to make me feel better while he's still in, hang on, I'm still processing being really mad and hurt, um, that's going to put more of a strain on your relationship. So I would encourage you to get additional compassion from other people in your life, not to the extent that you were from that therapist, but certainly to whatever extent you need it. That's just sort of where I wanted to start because I wouldn't want the letter writer to try to like lean too hard on her husband. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, when I first read this letter, I kind of took it in a very simple way, I think. I thought, yep, okay, something's happened. Makes sense that your husband is hurt and that's going to take some work. And, you know, I'm very hopeful for the letter writer that they're able to address their problems together in couples therapy and improve. And so I didn't really question that, that yes, your husband would be hurt and it will take some work. And I was thinking a lot about the therapist aspect of it. But then, you know, Danny, the more I thought about what happened in that therapy relationship, the more I thought I had to reframe my own response to this letter as well. Because partly, I guess, because I'm a speech language pathologist, I think about issues of ethics and the way we interact with our clients a lot. And Mm -hmm. um, it can feel like, well, I'm an adult and it was an interaction that we shared together. But actually the power dynamics and I guess the ethical responsibility of the therapist, it really troubles me that this situation happened to the letter writer. And I think that I understand what the letter writer is saying about not wanting to abdicate their personal responsibility. But the more I thought about this letter, the more I thought, This is not, I think, as simple as an extramarital affair with someone that you met at work or at the beach or, you know, someone that you know in any other context. It's a therapist that you were sharing your experiences with. You have a history of sexual trauma in particular. And then you engaged in sexualized interactions with your therapist. And for the letter writer, as well as anyone else who might be in that kind of situation, 
that's not the same as a normal relationship that's been building or, you know, two people are attracted to each other. There's definitely some concerns there for me. Yeah, I I think that's also really useful. And I think what I want to be able to try to encourage the letter writer to do is find a line in between both. Absolutely. The primary violation of like a professional code of conduct and ethics was the therapist and in her own life and in her relationship with her partner and figuring out how she wants to like think about what she wants going forward. It will be good in that sense to think about where she was coming from, her own choices, not to think of herself solely as someone who was acted upon. But that those, th- those things can be true at the same time. Like there's no board of ethics. There's no regulatory body of anything like any psychologist, any therapist, anybody with any kind of like license to, to practice in the field of mental health. They, they all universally, categorically, it is a violation to sleep with a patient. In some states, it's even a violation to sleep with a former patient for uh, like, I know in California, it's still a violation for like two years after your therapeutic relationship ends. Which is not to say, like, I think the best thing that would be for, like, him to go to jail. I just think, like, it is absolutely true that what he did was the serious professional violation and it was incumbent upon him. Even if you had said to him, like, I'm attracted to you or, like, I I really feel a chemistry here or I really wish we could, you know, hook up. Um, You know, the responsibility is still always going to be on the therapist, on the psychologist, psychiatrist, whomever, to maintain the boundary. Yeah. Um, I, I just mean in terms of in in terms of how you and your husband deal with it, I don't know that for your relationship you can just focus on my therapist did something wrong and that's it. Does that feel like I'm trying too hard to make a distinction or like I'm trying to have it both ways? Cause I don't want to be just saying like, yeah, 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 sure, he was wrong, but really you're just as responsible as anybody. Like h- how does that feel yeah. like in terms of a a split? I think that's fair. I think that's what I was thinking about too. Initially, you know, I was thinking about the relationship that this letter writer has with their husband and that this is something that they have to work through together. But I think that the reason it is complicated is because something has happened to them. So I think it's good if they are starting therapy individually and separately, perhaps the couple's counselling. What do you think about their question about how to mend the situation? Yeah, and gosh, of course, part of what's tricky is, you know, there's that bit at the end of like, well, we're, you know, I'm trying to find a new therapist and we're looking at a couples counselor. And I felt like maybe it was implied or or, or potentially present was like, well, this also happened in the context of therapy. So I would really understand if both the letter writer and her husband felt sort of newly anxious about therapy. Um, And again, like that's one of the many, many reasons that it is not a good idea to cross any kind of sexual lines with your patients. Um, And and so I I guess I would just say mostly like letter writer, that would make sense if that came up. I hope you and your husband both can find ways to talk about that and acknowledge it. I wondered if, you know, that sort of parenthetical of I'm seeing a new therapist soon, she's a woman. The implication was sort of like, so it's going to not be so bad because she won't be a man. But then the fact that the letter writer mentioned in the first paragraph, I'm a queer woman, it's it's not like just, oh, having this kind of therapist will solve your problem or there could be no anxieties that would come up in the context of your marriage. So none of that's to say don't see this new therapist or don't find a couples counselor together. Just it would make sense if you feel newly anxious about therapy. It would make sense if you had some more sort of research or digging or conversations you have to have together before you find someone. Uh, What do you think uh, in terms of Should the letter writer consider reporting her former therapist to his state board? Um, Does that feel like, you know, it didn't come up here, but I felt like it was sort of hovering in the wings. Maybe I'm reading way too much into this letter. I feel like this is the third or fourth time I've said, like, I feel like there's an unspoken question. (laughs) Well, I think the same thing. I don't think you're reading too much into it. When I read this letter, I thought this letter writer is thinking a lot of things and having a lot of feelings. I don't think they mentioned that, although they said that they have these feelings about the betrayal by their therapist. And I think that it is a really real possibility to consider reporting them. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, you know, when you've got a patient or a client, 
they are vulnerable and there's a reason we try not to transgress boundaries. It's so that people feel safe to talk about things. Mm -hmm. And in this case, if this situation happened with this patient, I find it very hard to believe that therapist isn't doing something similar with other patients. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not often that it's a one-off situation. And I'm really happy that the letter writer has ceased their contact with that therapist, but that doesn't mean someone else isn't in the same position. Yeah. Yeah. And and as you say, like that doesn't make the letter writer personally responsible for future, you know, patients or clients. But certainly I think it's very, very real. Like, you know, there's been some studies about like the harmful effect. Like it's, it's not just Puritanism, right? It's not just like no fun. Um, there are excellent reasons why mental health professionals are not allowed to have sexual contact with their clients or their patients. It, it disrupts the therapeutic relationship. It preys upon, you know, profound vulnerabilities. It turns something private into something secret. Um, you know, there's been a, a number of studies like done on the sort of follow-up after effects and people whose therapists transgress those boundaries with them, even if it is consensual, you know, they often experience really intense like disruption in terms of cognitive dysfunction, in terms of memory. They they often feel like emotionally incredibly disrupted, uh, mistrust, empty, isolated, guilty. Uh, and, you know, I, I want to be sort of clear that none of this means that you have to kind of go back and retroactively think, I must not have consented. So you don't have to feel worse about it than you do. I, I guess I just mean it is possible for it to have been both consensual in as much as at the time you wanted it and also like a deep abuse of his relationship to you, a deep professional and ethical violation. And so again, none of that's to say this should make your husband, you know, 40% happier, just that you are also entitled to feel in addition to the guilt and shame that you have felt about lying, um, a, a real sense of, and that's not something a therapist should do, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that anything that you might have done is something you now have to feel good about, but yeah, it's really, it is incumbent upon that therapist, no matter how much a patient might be attracted to them. Like that doesn't matter. You, you, you do your job. No. And if you have feelings for a client or a patient, you extract yourself from that situation. You know, that is the professional way to respond. And you're right. I'm not trying to imply that it's non-consensual, but certainly there's a responsibility that I think the letter writer is aware of, the responsibility of the therapist. But going back to, I think, something you mentioned earlier that no, they possibly can't expect that their husband will be the person that will have the most sense of empathy in that moment, but perhaps there is a friend that they can confide in. I hope that their new therapist is helpful and possibly would be helpful in working out whether they do want to report their former therapist. Mm -hmm. I think they do need support. I think it is a complicated situation. So hopefully they can find someone that they can rely on in that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think both with uh, the letter writer's new personal individual therapist and with this potential new couples therapist they find together to also just really open with, like, I experienced this pretty serious violation in my last therapeutic relationship. That's going to be coming up. Um, I I think, too, just my sort of last thought about the former therapist is, again, because, like, you know, when you become a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, they train you. You know what I mean? Like, they... This is not like, oh, he, he might not have realized sometimes you might be attracted to a patient. Like there's, there's been a lot of, you know, writing and, and thinking that has gone into these like ethics guides and, and into ideas of like transference and counter transference. Like he was absolutely trained. Here's how you handle it if you find yourself attracted to a patient. Here's how you handle it if a patient, you know, seems to be flirting with you. He was not like a babe in the woods. Like they they get you ready for handling that appropriately. He made the decision not to handle it appropriately. And in so doing, he really damaged the relationship between the two of you. And so I just, it, it, it just, letter writer, I really share your sense of both feeling like I'm really sad and disappointed that I lied to my husband like that. I really kidded myself when I tried to convince myself that it wasn't really cheating. And then also I feel really like, fucked up about the way that my therapist took advantage of me. Those things can all be true at the same time. So I I feel like that's maybe enough in terms of like trying to apportion weight or responsibility or blame. 
and and I hope letter writer that you at least consider the possibility of reporting this. I think it would be a good thing. I think what your therapist did really disqualifies him from being a useful therapist to people and it would be really really good for him to experience consequences. You know, n- none of this means that you would be it would just it would be good for him to be experiencing consequences. It's not like you're being tasked with throwing him in jail for 100 years. We don't have to like worry about like disproportionate responses in that sense. But then just in terms of it makes sense that your husband's going to take some time to recover from this. And so to try to figure out what are reasonable steps we can take in the direction of like peace, neutrality, renewed trust, rather than like trying to put too much weight too soon on our like recently sprained ankle, if that makes sense. Um, But also, as your subject implies, I also don't want you to feel like I just am going to always be in the doghouse for the rest of my life. Um, And so also trying to figure out do we both want to get past this? Like, is that what we both want? Because it's possible that that's not. And if that's not the case, you want to be able to talk about it. And if it is, how will you know you're making progress? What will that look like? It's not not as simple as like, I promise in six months, I'll be 30% less upset. And then in, you know, eight months, we'll be 70 back to normal or anything like that. But having sort of quantifiable goalposts, so you're not suddenly waking up and it's three years later and he still doesn't really trust you, I think will, will go a long way. And, uh, you know, beyond that, it sounds like your husband is most hurt by the lying. And so I wonder if one of the things you can talk about is at at some point, maybe again in therapy, if you say like, let's say that this, we were like somehow back in time and I came to you the first day and I said, I have feelings for my therapist. Would that have been a conversation you and I would have been able to have? Not that that would have meant then, oh, let's, let's open up and be in a thruple with our therapist. but like, would that really have been something that we could talk about? And if so, how can we talk about that now? Because I think that that's really meaningful, that the lying was the part that felt the most painful. And I think sometimes people just think, well, you can't talk to your partner about having strong feelings for someone else. That's the thing that must never be spoken. So you must try to drive it underground and then fail and then have an affair. Um, And I think that might be another useful way forward too. Sorry, I just talked a lot. If you want to take over for a second, I'll shut up. No, no, I think that that's really a great point. And I think in terms of growth and healing, that is what needs to happen in their relationship, doesn't it? You know, how can we talk about these things? How can we do things differently next time? Yeah. And again, I just, I hope your next therapists are really great, responsive, super clear about your previous therapist doing something deeply wrong and disqualifying. And I hope that you can get additional support that you won't always be able to get from your husband. Obviously, I want him to like generally be able to demonstrate like care and affection, but I also can understand if he's like, I need to be upset on my own behalf right now. I can't also comfort you on on all fronts. And so just reaching out to to others. And that doesn't mean you have to tell all your friends, um, you know, that you had like a, a sexting relationship with your therapist. I can understand if that feels like vulnerable enough that you don't want to go telling all your buddies, but um, to, to whatever extent you're able to just discuss the broad outlines of what happened and get support, that would be something that I would really want for you. Yeah. Yeah. And good luck. Please write back. I'd love to hear back from you, letter writer. I'm again, really sorry that you had a bad trip, but I also just really want to affirm, I don't think you have a magic mushrooms problem. And if anything, even though it's like painful and awful right now, I'm glad at least that you have things out in the open and that you can try to start again and talk about things in a different way. And I I think that's just often my goal. Like, I I worry sometimes I'm just pushing too hard and saying like, everyone should just be in an open relationship and just don't mind. Um, And that's not really my vision for the world so much as I really, really do want people who deeply love their partners to also be able to find language for talking about having even quite strong feelings for other people that doesn't strike them as such a an ego obliterating prospect that they just are like that's the one thing i could never say because when that kind of speech becomes impossible if you love someone deeply and you spend 50 years of your life with them the odds that you're never even once going to have like an errant strong feeling for someone else is pretty low and so then i, I just fear like that fear of harming the person you love best almost creates the seeds of like some sort of deceit, some kind of avoidance, some kind of infidelity that I think would be so much better served by non-anxious conversation about attraction or powerful feelings that doesn't necessarily result in, you have my blessing, go have sex with everyone you want to, but that also doesn't look like once you marry me, if you ever mention having a crush on someone else, it's just going to destroy me.
if you're ready, I think this last one is is in some ways our most complicated texts, and in other ways is is really really straightforward, which is kind of a nice way to to close. So the subject line is "Tried my best to condense it," which is an amazing title, and I also condensed it, and it's still really long, but that's okay. This is a follow up, and so you're allowed to go long in a follow up. And the the letter that this is following up from is from an episode that came out back in um, September of 2022. Uh, it's the Kate Beaton episode, and the the name of the question I think at the time was clingy sister syndrome. So for anybody who wants to go back, I think um, Bonnie, you said that you had actually you remembered listening to it at the time. I did remember listening to it, but I'm not sure about some of the details. So please refresh. I will. Yeah. And in some ways, again, like it's a mistake to get bogged down too much in the details because the question is fundamentally, I am, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the way estranged with someone. And that's really hard. What do I do? And that's a tough one because in some ways it's easier to go the full 100. But I really don't think that's what the letter writer wants here. And I don't think, you know, again, like to go against myself, I'm often encouraging people to stop talking to their relatives. But I also really don't want someone to have to do that if they don't have to. So. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'll stop clearing my throat and I'll just read it. I'm the estrangee from clingy sister syndrome. There are some details that I didn't realize might be relevant when I first wrote in. My older siblings and I were raised together, but they came from our mother's first marriage and there's a seven-year gap between the youngest and me. My dad adopted everyone else. This is relevant now because my sister has this fantasy material for getting a second chance to have a father and I'm suddenly on the receiving end of this. At one point, I compiled some of the worst details into a letter that I sent to my parents and my paternal aunts who had wanted to know why I had cut contact and changed my name when I moved across the country. I got no response, and I eventually took it down because it had served its purpose, and I realized I sometimes get too quick to mobilize when I'm convinced it's on behalf of someone else. That, by the way, letter writer, is an excellent piece of self-awareness and one that I uh, only learned much later in life than I would have liked to. So I, I share that compulsion. And uh, I, I share your sense of it doesn't work out as well as you wish it would. I did eventually set a boundary with my sister and even suggested therapy to her. Even though she hasn't pursued it, our relationship did change. I got out of all the overly familiar parts about my being her best friend again. But then I was also put on a, quote, information diet about her kids. Before, I had been exchanging videos with them all the time through her phone since they're all too young to text me themselves. But then the tone of our conversations closed off and I opted not to chase the carrot, letting contact slide off into a mutual shallow zone while she shared celebratory posts on Facebook about how brave she is for cutting people out of her life when they don't try hard enough. A few months into this stalemate, I vented to my sister over text during an especially difficult time. I'm 24 and living with strangers and everything felt really tenuous and we were in violation of our lease. This turned into a phone call that ended up lasting six hours until her husband got home listening to her talk about years of frustration in her marriage. This included details like her husband punching walls, yelling at my nephews, and breaking phones in anger. I went into action mode and gave her as many resources as I could. She told me that they already had a plan in place for if they separated, that they talked about all the time how he would get a trailer on their land and live there while she kept the house and the kids. I told her that if she really did kick her husband out, I would find a subletter and leave my apartment and move back to the middle of nowhere in the Bible Belt and be with her and help her with the kids. She agreed that she was serious, and yes, of course, and this would be a dream come true, right up until just after the 24-hour window where I could have gotten my money back from the plane ticket I bought. Then she said that her husband wasn't that bad, really, and that I should instead buy myself a trailer and move it onto their land. It's not the first time that something has come up that's proven that she tells me whatever she feels like in order to get the reaction she wants. I'm increasingly glad I didn't go. I've always hated my brother-in-law. I don't think he's a good father, and I don't believe my sister has any interest in leaving the marriage. Even if that someday changes, I don't think I can be the one who helps her with that. Not long after adding my sister on social media and after changing my name, I got a request from someone who went to our childhood megachurch. I asked her if she thought he recognized me or just thought I was some weird new friend of the family. She said she had a theory that the guy thought I had died. I'd left up my old profile, but it was inactive for a few years, and he had dutifully posted a happy birthday message at the same time every year. I think no matter what, this would have been upsetting to me, but it especially hurt because we had just had our first really vulnerable conversation in months right before this. I had told her during the period that we were talking about my moving in with her, 
what a relief it would be just to know that someone was around who could make sure that people who needed to knew something happened to me would know if I died, since all my favorite people live very far from me. I don't really know what the procedure is here. I feel bad for blaming her for not understanding that even though I said I forgave her, I clearly don't, but that's not how I would treat someone who forgave me. What's the statute of limitations on that kind of thing? Should I just wait around for her to stick her foot in her mouth again? Or is joking about someone thinking I was dead when I had gone through multiple mental health hospitalizations in the year that profile was dormant feel as mean to you as it feels to me? It's right up there with some of the commentary she shared about how my mom would talk about me when it just doesn't feel like the kind of thing I need to know someone else thinks about me. I didn't need to know that my mother woke up every morning upset to spend the t- a day with me, and I don't need to know that my sister thinks it's funny if people think I'm dead. So, as I said, there's a lot of a lot here, but I feel like it was in some ways sort of in conversation with our last letter in terms of like, what's a degree of joking or meanness or potential meanness or crossed wires that we should tolerate in our relationships with other people? And if we don't tolerate it, is there any way to say this hurt me or I would like you to apologize or I would like you to not do this again that isn't a huge conflict, that isn't like I'm confronting you, we're having it all out? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, I think the interesting thing is that if it's a person who cares about you and generally has good boundaries and doesn't make mean jokes that are targeted to hurt people, they will understand when you have that conversation and they will say, you know, they'll understand, okay, I said something or I misspoke, my intention wasn't bad, I apologize or I can understand why that hurt you. But unfortunately, the people that we often have to have those conversations with are not the people who understand and are not ever going to respond to a reasonable discussion about it. I don't think this letter writer's sister is going to say, oh, I understand why you're upset about that. I think it's more likely they're going to say, I was just making a joke. Can't you have a sense of humor about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that's likely too. I don't want to say 100% guarantee, but I also think that's likely. And and if anything, I think it's just really in keeping with the, the letter writer's sister more generally thinking the two of them are closer than they are. So like that question of, does this seem as mean to you as it does to me? It really depends. Like I I could see somebody making that joke in a way that felt funny and like maybe slightly gallows humor, but mostly like warm and aware of you. And I could see it being painful and dismissive. And I think it just, I I think the reason that it landed the way that it did was not because it was like universally offensive, but just because it was like, once again, she wants to be jokey where I want to be serious. She wants to rush past certain layers of intimacy and just like insist that we're close when we're not. She doesn't want to like do the work that I want her to do before she sort of earns the right to joke like this with me. And that's just really understandable. So, you know, there's also just a ton of other stuff undergirding this, right? Which is like, and she also like Lucy and the footballed me about coming to like live with her and the kids. And maybe also letter writer, you were sort of surprised to realize I thought I was okay keeping everybody at arm's length. But then as soon as my sister was vulnerable and honest with me, it reminded me of how badly I want a family connection. And I offered to move in with her and help her raise her children, even though I kind of can't stand her. And none of that's to say you were wrong to do that. Just I think it's worth paying attention to, man, I offered to like change my whole life to live with someone I don't really trust because in some way I'm so hungry for that kind of connection and where's a safer place I can put some of that or like how can I honor or take care of that vulnerability in myself without necessarily trying again with her right now. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. You know, I think the vulnerability of this letter writer is so obvious in that really strong response. You know, this was the first phone conversation they'd had in years. They spoke for hours. Their sister confided in them. But that is a very, very big step to offer to take. And the letter writer even booked a flight, which is huge too. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it is worth really thinking about, you know, that emotional response, like you said, and why they had that or why they think that that would have been helpful. I know the letter writer has come around to saying, I'm not sure I could help my sister with this or she wasn't being sincere in what she said in that phone call. But 
or maybe was sincere in that moment, but didn't have plans mm-hmm. to follow through or later felt sincere in a different direction. And, you know, people are complicated and a marriage is complicated. So the sister maybe has very real, you know, reasons for thinking about things and obviously having this idea. But even the solution to say you can come and live in a trailer on our property is such a different thing to what the letter writer has conveyed about what they would like from life that I think there's a real mismatch here. And I think the letter writer is putting a lot of responsibility on themselves even when they say they're not putting responsibility on themselves about their family. And I think they need to really take some care for themselves instead. Yeah. I think it's connected with that line in the first paragraph, I get too quick to mobilize when I'm convinced it's for someone else which was sort of first about that letter that they had sent to their parents. And then later, I think, kind of came up again of my sister confessed some genuinely like distressing stuff about the state of her marriage. And again, none of this letter writer is like, wow, you're bad for feeling compassion. You were like wrong or foolish to want to connect with your family. Oh man, all that stuff is so human, so understandable. Also, you're 24 and like living in a like tenuous situation. It makes so much sense. I hope you don't feel in any way like, judged for having that impulse or for buying that plane ticket. That makes so much sense to me. But I do want you to be able to, now that you are kind of more aware of this tendency of when I feel like somebody else needs my help, I want to drop everything and move the earth. Maybe you can use some of that information to buy yourself a little bit more time. And like the next time you feel really moved to do something like incredibly like chivalrous. Chivalrous? Chivalrous? That's not right. Chivalrous? Sure. Chivalrous. A big gallant gesture. Not that you should never, ever do one or that it's always bad, but just to like pause and say like, I should sleep on this. Or like, sometimes this really feels right in the moment and later it doesn't work out. Is there a smaller thing I can do first? Um, And, you know, this is maybe something you can share with friends or potentially someday a therapist. And it's not something that you're going to immediately stop doing overnight, but you can find better ways to sort of redirect some of that energy. And and then I just think like, you can, I think, try to say to your sister, hey, I know that you didn't mean it that way. But when you did joke about that guy thinking I might have been dead, I'm just kind of sensitive about that. If you, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like it if we don't joke about that again. I, I think that's like a more diplomatic than honest. But the thing that that would potentially get you is it would circumvent any defensiveness from her, which is what I really want you to be able to avoid. And so by leading with, I'm kind of sensitive about this, you sort of like preempt her saying you're being too sensitive Again, feel free if you hear that and you're just like, that sounds like prevaricating bullshit. I'm not going to say that. By all means, don't. But I I would think of this sister as somebody with whom it is worth maintaining some kind of a relationship, but also who you are unlikely to get a lot of emotional reciprocity from. And so if the most you can kind of ask of her is like not to occasionally bump into your sensitive spots, that's worth getting. Um, And then letting some of the other stuff go just because... You don't really trust her with deep, vulnerable stuff. That would make a ton of sense to me. And then I would suggest diplomacy over like radical honesty. Yeah, I think trying to circumvent that possible defensiveness is a really good approach to take because that joke was upsetting to the letter writer. And I think that's reasonable to try and avoid that. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, people, whether they realize it or not, will keep making jokes about something that, is, you know, perhaps upsetting or a trigger. And it can sometimes even be that because we didn't say anything, but we might freeze up in that moment, you know, the other person, they sort of pick up on that and they return to that moment. So I think if the letter writer can successfully talk about this with their sister, that would be a good idea. And then the other thing I was thinking about when you were speaking, Danny, was that I want the letter writer to turn some of that mobilization towards themselves, Mm -hmm. you know, to develop some compassion for themselves as much as, you know, that really big response to their sisters um, confiding in them. I I think that if they can do things that, that, if the letter writer can do things that are about protecting themselves and supporting themselves, I think that would be really something that's a good life goal in your 20s to develop that self-compassion. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to just kind of realize, again, not that you have to completely 
turn your heart off to anyone you're related to. But it sounds like you've been really in the past hurt by trying to draw like water from that emotional well and to just kind of remind yourself like a lot of the tenderness or care or reciprocity that you would like to get from your relatives or even honesty you haven't been able to get despite your best efforts and that doesn't mean you have to tell them to lose your number and never talk to any of them again but it does mean that if for the bulk of those emotional needs you should be looking elsewhere in your life and again you're 24 you're quite young you're just starting to establish like your own adult life outside of college and growing up and that it, it, you know, you don't develop like lifelong friendships overnight. Um, so this in some ways will be the work of of many years, but you absolutely can and should do it. You sh- you deserve it. I want you to be able to eventually feel like you have people in your life who who are stable and who love you and who you can like navigate conflict with without just things kind of falling apart. Um, and I just wish you nothing but the best. And again, just it, of course, it makes sense that it felt hurtful. She hasn't earned that right to joke with you. Um, and, and she's also really, really stepped on your feelings, um, so many times in the past. I think not to say this joke is all about the other things. I just think it feels especially big because of that. It it might not have felt as big if she were somebody who otherwise really was there for you. Mm. I think that's kind of my, my last thoughts on, on this one so far. Um, thank you so much letter writer for writing back with a little bit more information. I really do hope things get better. Um, do you have any sort of final thoughts for any of our letter writers or anyone generally, anyone looking to sort of cut down on the amount of distress they have to navigate on a regular basis? Um, I think all of the letter writers today were just really thoughtful people. And I, I definitely value that. I think, um, you know, to be able to think about our feelings and other people's feelings is really valuable, especially in a time when we're constantly thinking about ourselves as well. Mm-hmm. But I think, um, I just think that, you know, if we can ascribe good values to each other, you know, assume that people aren't trying to be cruel or upsetting, that can be good. But equally not believing, oh, they never meant to say that, or people can never hurt you if they love you. I think finding a balance between that is probably the most challenging aspect of relationships and being human. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Well, thank you so much for bringing some of your uh, own thoughts and and ideas to bear here. I really appreciate it, especially given how early it is for you. I hope you get to go spend another three hours just recovering from this before you have to do anything else. Well, I do have some time, so that's lucky. Hell yeah. Oh, well, thank you again. And I'd love to have you back on the show again. So Maybe we'll save up some more follow-ups and try to do another like uh, deep read-through in the future. Oh, I would love that, Danny. I love your podcast so much. Shucks. Thanks for joining us on Big Mood, Little Mood with me, Danny Lavery. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Don't miss an episode of the show. Head to slate.com slash mood to sign up to subscribe or hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using right now. Thanks. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know what you think. If you want more Big Mood, Little Mood, you should join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members get an extra episode of Big Mood, Little Mood every Friday, and you'll get to hear more advice or conversations with our guest. And as a Slate Plus member, you'll also be supporting the show. Go to slate.com forward slash mood plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. If you'd like me to read your letter on the show, maybe you need a little advice, maybe you need some big advice, head to slate.com slash mood to find our big mood, little mood listener question form or find a link in the description on the platform you're using right now. Thanks for listening. And here's a preview of our Slate Plus episode coming this Friday. If you're going to say something bitchy about a relative and their new partner, you really, really should not be so confident that they're like upstairs. Like, right, they're in the same house with you. Don't be that confident and mean. You need to be more sneaky and mean if you want to be that mean without it like causing problems for you. Yeah, you have to whisper. Yeah, you got to whisper. You got to frankly wait until you're not in the same house. Like... Uh, again, like if you want to be this mean, you have to be very canny. And uh, it's it's just rough combining like naivete with meanness. It's not a good pairing. They don't go well together. It's like honey on eggs. 
<laughs> that is a weird pairing, honey on eggs. Right, like it's both honey and eggs are good and like you could mix them with a bunch of other things to make, I don't know, honey cake, but just honey on a soft boiled egg, I wouldn't enjoy it. It wouldn't go well together. To listen to the rest of that conversation, join Slate Plus now at slate.com forward slash mood.